This is one of the four best herbs if you have bloating, gas, and SIBO. Now in traditional Chinese medicine, we often call this diagnosis spleen qi deficiency. Now that's a really a terrible translation of what is basically a Han Dynasty term for certain kinds of gut dysbiosis, but not just the gut issues. So in this video, I wanna share, I think the four most common herbs that I use clinically on a day-to-day -day basis for probably 70% of patients that come in. If you have bloating, gas, food allergies, and fatigue, check this video out because I think it's going to help you a lot. Hey guys, I'm Dr. Alex Hine, board licensed acupuncturist and doctor of traditional Chinese medicine and author of the health book, Mastel the Day. So let's jump in. Let's talk about SIBO, gut dysbiosis, these little herbies, and my life story, which is basically gut issues. While day to day these days, my gut is not something I excessively worry about, and I eat bread, sugar, coffee from time to time, wine, and every now and then things flare up, but in general, it's nothing like what it was when I had my significant GI issues, which is really what pushed me into this medicine. When I was in my early 20s, one of the main symptoms I started developing was a cluster, or I should say a cluster of symptoms, one pattern. I started getting a very irregular bowel movements. For example, I noticed I would go to get a sandwich. I wouldn't have a bowel movement for three days. I wouldn't even think about it. I wouldn't even notice it. And then when I was feeling uncomfortable or feeling abdominal pain or gas or bloating, I just couldn't figure out why or what was causing it. In retrospect, sure, if you haven't gone to the bathroom for three days, it's pretty obvious. But then there were days where I would have daily bowel movements and I was still feeling a lot of pressure and gas and fullness. And I felt like I couldn't digest anything. And I felt food was sitting in my stomach for hours. And I just didn't understand how I was the healthiest eater I knew who had a clean diet and I had that for my whole life. I was raised in that family. When I went to college, I continued to cook. I didn't really eat out with my buddies that much and I couldn't quite figure out what was it that was going on with my gut. Now, these days they would easily diagnose me with either IBS or SIBO or probably both. While maybe there was an element of truth to both of them, neither would really be the accurate medical diagnosis. But one thing I have to say for sure is that thank God the GI specialists that I saw were completely and utterly useless because it never would have pushed me to find this incredible medicine. And I do believe that was one of those redirections from God, that this was one of those twists of fate. Like the person who's going to be the great Ivy League trained surgeon, they get sick and through a weird twist of fate, it brings them down a side path that is far more incredible than they ever could have imagined. Now, in traditional Chinese medicine, this diagnosis we call spleen qi deficiency. It's a bad translation because a lot of these symptoms don't relate to the anatomical spleen at all. It's probably more the pancreas itself. Pancreas deals with enzyme production, for example, is an issue in people with spleen qi deficiency. Within this diagnosis, you will often see issues like food allergies. Appetite tends to be low, but not always. Sometimes people have to constantly eat to feel like they're getting energy. Typically loose stools, food baby after eating. They may also have low immunity. They get sick easily. They get colds and flus easily. And there may be other issues, right? There can be discharge. There can be runny nose. There can be constant phlegminess and clearing the throat. All of these issues involving mucosa, whether they are vaginal mucosa, gut mucosa, nasal mucosa, ENT mucosa, can be related to this diagnosis. What are some of the herbs that we use most commonly? These are probably the most common worldwide, whether you're in US, China, Taiwan, Korea, from traditional medicine practitioners that use Chinese medicine. But I thought I would share four of the most common, how we use them, and at least one little interesting research tidbit for each. Now, a lot of these symptoms of gut dysbiosis I've included on this free root cause quiz that I've included below. The first link below this video, I've put together this 10 page or so quiz to help you figure out what pattern your symptoms are coming from. Basically, so you can diagnose yourself according to TCM. So if you have, let's say, headaches or migraines and you have gut dysbiosis, you can look on that quiz, score yourself and realize, oh, it's probably coming from this organ or what we call pattern differentiation. It's like a differential diagnosis in medicine, but for Chinese formulas. Check that quiz out. We've also taken the time to really link to five or 10 related videos on that exact organ system or that symptom. So you can really do a deep dive in your symptoms. I mean, it's really quite a extensive free guide. So I'd highly recommend checking out that quiz there. So herb number one, one of the king of medicinals, Renshen or ginseng. Now within traditional Chinese medicine, Renshen or ginseng we typically use for GI issues, which is interesting because when you look at the clinical research on it, and when you look at how naturopathic doctors and functional doctors use ginseng, most of the time the way that they use it is not for the gut. They typically use it for stabilizing the HPA axis. So the HPA axis is one of those physiological pathways in the body that deals with certain kinds of stress. People who have chronic anxiety, chronic depression, chronic 
fatigue, autoimmune disease, chronic insomnia, or other issues involving chronic nervous system dysregulation, often see a really great improvement from supplementing with this herb or these formulas. But in Chinese medicine, we use it exclusively for strengthening spleen qi. It's amazing for people who have stomach pain, gastritis, upper GI issues like acid reflux, certain kinds, not all kinds. Great for low appetite, improving enzyme production. Amazing herb, but not used alone. So. In one particular study, ginseng was found that it also improves cognitive performance and also reduces mental fatigue. Ancient doctors called renshen an herb that tonifies the qi. And often ginseng will produce more energy in people that are qi deficient. Herb number two is called fooling or poria. Now, fooling is an herb that works well. It's a mild diuretic, so it can improve kidney function or treat urinary problems. Fooling is also an herb that is a godsend for anxiety. If you have bloating, GI issues and anxiety, this herb is your best friend. We use this at high doses. Fooling is very, very good because it helps with abdominal fullness. Again, we say bloating, excessive mucus production, clearing the throat is a sign of dampness. This herb, Baiju, attract the loads, and fooling are two of the most important combos used for this diagnosis of spleen chi deficiency and dampness. A lot of bloating, a lot of clearing of the throat, that kind of thing. Now, these herbs in particular are very, very good also for anxiety. So fooling is very, very effective at working on the neurotransmitter working with serotonin. So I've shared a study here before that they did a study on rats where they exposed them to stress by basically practically drowning them. It's a horrible study. And then they gave poria, fooling, to these rats. They found that it moderated or modulated their anxiety as a result of this stressor. So for those of you that get high anxiety under stress or when you're not sleeping well, fooling is an amazing herb. Now, in terms of the clinical research, one study found that the polysaccharides from poria can enhance your immune function by stimulating the macrophages and other immune cells. So research on poria, fooling itself, have found that poria can enhance the immune system by stimulating certain kinds of immune cells. Another study found that compounds from poria actually can cause cancer cells to rupture and will actually inhibit tumor growth. Herb number three is baiju, attractylodes. Now, Baidru is the god of what we call dampness. So signs of dampness in the body include things like constantly clearing your throat, bloating, runny noses, discharge, that kind of thing, even constant coughing. Some people cough after meals a lot, which is an upper GI issue. Baidru is one of the key herbs to do that. What's crazy about this herb is if I put it on my tongue for three seconds, I can feel it suck the moisture off my tongue. My tongue actually feels dried out right now from this baiju plant. Ancient people had observed that sometimes certain plants, for example, that grow in marshes or swampy areas have developed evolutionary adaptations to deal with the water and moisture and that they behave like that in the body as well. This is probably the precursor to the doctrine of signatures, right? This plant looks like a heart, so it can probably be used for a heart. It's kind of pseudoscientific, but sometimes it is true for certain plants. Baiju is one of those. In the clinical research, Baiju has been found <clears throat> to actually improve gastrointestinal function and has protective effects on the gastric mucosa. What is this excessive mucus in my throat? It's coming from <clears throat> the mucosa. In another study, they found that it can actually improve insulin sensitivity and lower blood glucose levels in diabetic models. Herbs that work on the spleen pancreas, right? Pancreas, we're talking about a lot of the physiological pathways that deal with, for example, example, diabetes and blood sugar regulation. A lot of spleen chi deficiency formulas are great for diabetics as well. Renshen is one of the best herbs for lowering your blood sugar levels. Herb number four is called Huangqi or astragalus. Now Huangqi is often used for low immunity. So while Huangqi can be used for this kind of spleen chi deficiency diagnosis, Huangqi is a little bit more moisturizing. So for some people it can actually generate a little bit of too much chest fullness with a feeling of fluid. But what Huangqi is used for often is low immunity, general exhaustion, chronic fatigue, people who get cold and sick easily. Now in studies done on Huangqi, researchers found that it can actually stimulate the immune system by enhancing the activity of T cells and natural killer cells. In terms of the cardiovascular system, it can actually protect against heart disease by improving endothelial function and reducing oxidative stress. And in terms of anti-aging, astragalus or Huangqi can delay aging processes by enhancing telomerase activity, right, the telomeres, and protecting against age-related cellular damage. Huangqi is also a very potent anti-cancer you can go right on the Memorial Sloan Kettering cancer website. There's a long entry on Huangqi and its anti-cancer effect on cells. Four herbs that are really, really effective for treating this pattern of bloating, food allergies, 
what we call spleen chi deficiency and gut dysbiosis. Now, I work with a limited number of new patients every single month in my clinic in Los Angeles or virtually via telemedicine. If you guys want to learn more and work with me one on one, just go to dralexheim.com forward slash clinic or you can check out the information in the bio of this video. I have my clinic, I have the phone number, I have our email where you can reach out to us. And again, I work with a limited number of people each month. Don't forget to go download that quiz. It will really help you understand a bit more the root cause of where your symptoms are coming from. The whole thing is totally free. And I have a related video on this exact topic, bloating, SIBO, food sensitivities, right up here.